this anime dropping was the most unexpected thing to happen this year. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it just sort of came out of nowhere. For each anime season, I usually check a full list of anime that will be airing so I can get an idea of what to watch, and Cyberpunk Edgerunners was not on any list that I've seen. I only found out about this anime because people on Twitter were really hyping it up. I was very interested in the Cyberpunk 2077 game, but I never played it because I didn't have a PS5, and I heard that there were some issues with the game on the PS4 version. I gave this anime a chance because I had always been interested in this world and it exceeded my wildest expectations. I originally wasn't going to make a video on this because the hype for the show had already died down, but I just really wanted to talk about it, so here we go. If you're looking for a spoiler free review, I'll give you a really quick one right now. Cyberpunk Edgerunners is a surprisingly good anime and it's definitely worth the watch. It's only 10 episodes long, but it tells a full story really effectively. It is far from perfect though. I watched the dub because that's what was recommended to me by almost everyone on the internet and the dub was definitely good, but the dialogue was a bit awkward in some places. Cyberpunk Edgerunners has the hot rodster seal of approval, so if you're still watching this video and you haven't seen the anime yet, I highly recommend that you stop watching this video and come back later once you've seen the show. With that out of the way, let's talk about David Martinez. High time I chromed the f up. The boy who didn't live. He started off as a really sympathetic character at the beginning of the show because he was screwed over by the system in the most ruthless way possible. David and his mother were obviously suffering from poverty which made it difficult for them to afford things like laundry, a good education, the software required for that education, rent for an apartment, and a decent healthcare plan. If you watch my hero's journey video then you'd know that this is all part of building David's ordinary world which basically just establishes for the audience who this character is and how they interact with the world around them. David's ordinary world was very crappy in the way the world was set up, it was almost as if his mother's death was inevitable. Her death forced me to quickly realize that this world was a dystopia despite everything looking so bright, futuristic, and evolved from the outside. Eventually, David ended up joining Maine's crew and became a cyberpunk. It was frightening to see him change his lifestyle so drastically this quickly because it didn't look like David was built for this kind of violence. I was quickly proven wrong as he ended up becoming an excellent edge runner, but in the back of my mind, I was always worried for him. And during episode 4, I knew for certain that if David continued to follow his current path, he would wind up dead by the end of the show. The first thing that tipped me off was Pilar's death. He had been in the edge runner business longer than David, and he was more teched out than him as well, yet he still managed to get himself killed. But the one thing from that episode that completely convinced me of David's impending doom was when Lucy said, Don't make a name for yourself as a cyber punk by how you live make a name by how you die it's not the life or the end you deserve that quote was obviously foreshadowing David becoming a legendary cyberpunk and going out with a bang. And it made me a bit hesitant to even finish the series because I didn't want to see him die. This anime did a great job of making me get attached to these characters quickly because it hurt for me to see David throwing his life away. He had multiple chances to leave this life of crime and live up to his true corporate potential, but he decided to fully emerge himself in this dangerous lifestyle. This was made obvious after the time skip when he completely teched himself out to the point that I couldn't even tell how much of him was human rather than a machine. At that moment, I knew he was past the point of no return. He was now an experienced edge runner and his inevitable death was quickly approaching. While it did hurt me to see David throw his life away like this, I simultaneously felt great pride for him because he looked like he could take care of himself and he seemed more confident about what he wanted to do with his life. However, even though he had more confidence in what he wanted to do, he never had a real dream of his own. He first attempted to follow his mother's dream by going to an affluent school and climbing the corporate ladder to become a high class successful man. It was clear at the time that he wasn't really vibing with that mission and he dropped it when she died. Then after Maine died, he followed in his footsteps by taking care of the business and the people that he left behind while simultaneously attempting to help Lucy reach her dream of going to the moon. This somewhat made David a true hero in a way because he was always giving while never looking after himself nor his own interests. As a matter of fact, it was almost as if he refused used to look after himself, which is why he ended up succumbing to cyber psychosis in the end. He never wanted to accept that he had limits. He just kept telling himself that he was special and that he was built different. I'm built different. I just know it. 
it was painful for me and the people closest to him like Rebecca and Lucy to watch him hurt himself in this way, especially since we saw Maine go through the exact same thing. Even the doc seemed genuinely concerned for David, which definitely surprised me because it seemed like he just wanted to take advantage of him at the beginning when he sold him the faulty software and when he tried to rip him off for this and Devastan. But when he said, Just yesterday, a punk kid pushing XBDs for a quick buck. Go on, become that legend or whatever the f you mercs do. It seemed like he was disappointed in the path David was headed down. My soul hurt even more when I saw him using that cyber skeleton because he was definitely more machine than man at that point. It was very disturbing to look at because he just had a small human torso trapped between these giant pieces of metal. It looked unnatural in the most horrifying way. Something I believe this series did really well was use cyber psychosis to flash back to a lot of key moments in this 10 episode anime. Things like him getting picked on by that one bully with the dad at Arasaka, his last interactions with Maine, and his mother's death. It was really creative to use a well-established condition like this to represent what was on David's mind in the end, and to bring the entire series to a close. David's fight with Adam Smasher was done really well and the creators did a really good job at highlighting the parallels between these characters. They both had a Sandeva stand, were used by Arasaka, and had a high tolerance for tech. However, Adam Smasher had an even higher tolerance than David, which implied that he was actually more special than David was. It was really bizarre to see that there was someone more special than the protagonist himself, but it definitely felt real. I feel like most people have something that they are really good at, and then you feel crushed when you run into someone who is actually better than you at that one thing. This time, David finally met his match and died. He did go out with style by protecting his friends with his dying breath and became a legendary edge runner. His skill and potential were even acknowledged by Adam Smasher before he was killed by him. I had some fun after all. You know, you could prove an interesting construct. While I was sad to see him go, I was also proud of him for sacrificing himself in the most noble way possible. And speaking of David vs Adam Smasher, the fight scenes and action in this anime were all animated really well. The animation studio behind this was Studio Trigger, and they're pretty well known for their really cool, over the top, fluid animations. I especially liked the animation whenever David used the Sam Devastan with the glowing spine, time slowing down, and the green drag behind him whenever he moved. They also handled gore in this show really well. It wasn't too much, but I still I always felt unsettled when I saw a character spilling their guts out. The only thing I didn't really enjoy about the animation were some of the electronic transitions because they just felt a bit corny at times, but they were a very minor part of the show so it didn't bother me too much. But enough about that, let's talk about Lucy. Sorry David, looks like we gotta change our plans. You're back to 20. <laughs> because her character was very much hit or miss for me. She was somewhat interesting when she was first introduced as a cautious thief with a bit of a wild side, but she eventually became very bland. It was almost as if she had no real personality, which made it very difficult for me to relate to her in these earlier episodes. Another criticism I have regarding her character is that I never really felt any chemistry between her and David. The romance between these two wasn't done well at the beginning, but it did eventually grow on me around episode six, where I saw how much Lucy trusted David to watch over her and how she was very very scared of losing him forever. I also liked their romance more in episode 7 when she told David about her dark past which he never told anyone else about. Maybe I liked it because it felt intimate or maybe I liked it because that tragedy somewhat explained why she was the way she was and why it seemed as if David was the only person in the world who even mattered to her. She became less bland to me and it felt like I was finally getting to understand her character better. Despite these complaints about Lucy, I very much enjoyed her in this show. I love seeing her dream of going to the moon through the brain dance in episode 2. It felt magical as it portrayed being on the moon as a supernatural thing in a way that I had never seen another piece of media do. It was also a very bizarre dream for someone in Night City to have since from what I saw in episode 1, people in that city only really care about money, power, and status. It was so beautiful which made it so alarming when I found out about her betrayal. And speaking of her betrayal, it felt like she was forgiven by David a little too quickly for all of that. The show was only 10 episodes so I don't know if it had the time to deal with her betrayal in a proper way, but if they had, it could have made their romance feel a bit more natural when it started because they both would have had to deal with their thoughts and emotions together. Despite not seeing much of her personality at the beginning of the show, we always saw glimpses of her emotions whenever the moon was brought up. 
She looked very happy during the moon BD. She also kissed David when he promised to take her to the moon, which not only conveyed how much she truly cared about that goal, it demonstrated how much she cared about David and her desire to keep him from danger. David also mentioned her dream about the moon after the time skip and she was very happy that he remembered it. That moment implied that she felt very secure about David helping her accomplish her dream because he's such a dependable guy. Eventually she does end up fulfilling this dream, but it was obvious that her dream felt incomplete without David being there to enjoy it with her. The final scene demonstrated how Lucy actually put her love for David above this dream and the main reason she went to the moon was to honor his legacy. The song playing at the end was my favorite for this show. I believe it was called and it also played once in episode 2 during the moon BD. Every time I hear that song, I get overwhelmed with sadness because it reminds me of David's sacrifice and that he never got the chance to go to the moon with Lucy. I kid you not, I low-key became obsessed with that song after I finished the show. I listen to it all the time and maybe that's part of the reason why this video is coming out so late. I don't really have much to say about the other songs in the soundtrack other than they were also really good. The ending song, Let You Down, was amazing, and there's a music video version on YouTube. It tells a short and tragic story of Sasha, a former Netrunner on Main's crew, and if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend that you do. You can watch it for free on YouTube if you look up Let You Down. The opening was also great as a hype me up for the show, but I do like the ending a little bit more. I'm probably biased from that music video though. And speaking of Main's crew, it's about time that I talk about one of my favorite characters, Main. It's the end of the line for me but not for you. Fast is what you do best, ain't it? Just keep running. I really loved his character design because he looked so strong and powerful. He's a guy whose bad side I definitely wouldn't want to get on, but he treats all of his allies with kindness, which somewhat makes him a protector. He's like a gentle giant, strong and powerful, yet humble and kind. It's easy to see why David looked up to him because I quickly admired and wanted to follow this guy as soon as we saw more of his personality in episode three. Main was also the first in-depth analysis of what cyberpsychosis is as well. In the anime, we'd seen two other cases of this illness prior to Main getting it. The first was the dude at the beginning with the Sandeva stand who went on a killing spree until Max Tack came in and put him down. The second case was the hobo who chromed his third leg and killed Pilar without hesitation. While these incidents both happened before Main went crazy, Main cyberpsychosis was the first case where we, the audience, got to see what this was doing to him on a mental level. It really hurt to see him going in and out of reality because it implied that he was no longer fit to be anyone's protector anymore. He became a hazard to his crew. He injured Kiwi very badly and he got Dorio killed because he could stay focused in the heat of an intense battle. Once he realized that he couldn't protect anyone anymore, he fell over the edge and became a cyber psycho. His death was so touching because I was not ready to depart with this gentle guardian. He refused to let David die for his mistakes, and so he sacrificed himself instead. The crazy thing about him is that we don't really know much about his past life or ambitions, but it doesn't really matter. It's kind of like what Maine told David. I don't give two shits about people's pasts. As long as they pull their weight on the job, we good. We don't know much about his past, but he definitely pulled his weight in this show. He was amazing from start to finish and he quickly became one of my favorite characters. The last thing I really wanted to talk about was the world building that went into Night City. I haven't played the game, so I knew nothing about this city going in, but I feel like there was so much information I was able to absorb in these 10 episodes. The idea of combining technology with humans isn't new as that's literally what cyborgs are, and if you consume any media, you've probably seen a few of these guys who are at the very least heard of this concept. However, I don't believe I've seen a whole society of cyborgs who use technology integrated with their bodies like it's a normal thing. I was quickly able to grasp concepts unique to this world like cyberpsychosis, netrunners, ripper docs, edge runners, max tech, and countless other concepts. All of these were easy to learn without having too much exposition, which was just perfect for me. Cyberpsychosis interested me the most and it was the only one I decided to look up after finishing the show. And I found a Reddit comment from the creator of the franchise explaining what cyberpsychosis is. If you haven't read it and you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend checking it out. The link will be in the description, but for a brief summary, he said that David's humanity allowed him to handle the stress that the cyberware was putting on his body. These bits of knowledge really demonstrate how detailed this world truly is. Through the world building, I felt like I also got a deeper understanding of Kiwi and why she ended up betraying the crew the way that she did. I'm not gonna lie, my initial reaction was to hate her for her betrayal, especially since it seemed to come from nowhere. However, sometime after I finished this anime, I realized that this was all part of 
of the Night City life. They couldn't be a crew forever, so she either had to betray her crew or let them betray her first. And I can't completely fault her for making the choice that she did. I know you may believe this logic is faulty, but you have to realize that she was already low-key betrayed by Maine when he injured her during his psychosis. She probably didn't want to be in a situation where she was following someone who was experiencing cyberpsychosis as that could lead to a fatal outcome for her. David was in the early stages of cyberpsychosis and was trying to keep it a secret. However, Kiwi must have noticed something was off when she lost contact with him during a mission and when Lucy called her to ask her about David's condition. Rebecca told David that she put her life in his hands daily, and that's probably true for everyone else on the crew as well. Having an unstable leader was a recipe for disaster, so Kiwi probably just took the first offer she could get her hands on in order to leave this crew. I know I just talked a lot, but basically what I'm trying to say is Kiwi's betrayal was a symptom of the lifestyle they were all living. It was tragic and in the end she definitely regretted it, but a tragic outcome was guaranteed regardless. Another part of the world building I really enjoyed was Lucy's backstory. She talked about how she was forced to dive into the old net to look for something that Arasaka had lost. I don't know if the old net was different from the new net or why the new one even needed to be created, but these small bits of knowledge gave me so many more questions and made me so much more interested in this world. Her backstory also demonstrated how cruel people in this world were. They sacrificed children for their own selfish goals that we still don't even know about. I love that I have so many questions, but it's not like these unanswered questions take away from the quality of the story. Overall, Cyberpunk Edgerunners has quickly become one of my favorite anime. It's obvious that there was so much thought, time, and effort put into this world and I would love to explore more of it. I really want to get the Cyberpunk 2077 game just to see more of Night City and maybe also to kill Adam Smasher in order to get vengeance for David. I heard a lot of people say that they want to see a sequel and I think that would be a very bad idea. Lucy's story is basically done and I don't really see any need to add on to it in any way. However, I think it would be a really good idea to see another series within the same universe so we can explore more of this world. Maybe we can have a focus on a corporate route and the politics involved with that. Or maybe we could see some focus on the world outside of Night City. Something like a Night City kid learning how to adjust to life on the outside or vice versa sounds like an interesting idea to me. Before I end this video, I want to say I know I didn't really talk about Rebecca that much. She was amazing, but the script for this video was getting a little long, so I decided not to really mention her. If this video does well, then I probably will create a video professing my love for her character, so make sure to like and share if you want to see that. Until then, later chooms.